Love the opportunity to be here. I've met a lot of you, a lot of you are familiar. Some, I think I saw some of you at the startup weekend. And what we're going to talk about today is something I'm really passionate about. I want to just quickly kind of get to know the audience a little bit. How many of you identify, would identify as an entrepreneur in this room? Okay. How many of you uh, would identify as a sales something? Okay, so a few less. How many of you are working on a startup of your design, of your creation, currently? Okay, and how many are working for a startup? Now, by startup, we can move our way down and down the stages, right? We're talking revenue. Uh, doesn't have to be a whole bunch, but we're in a startup. It's an established model. It's a proven concept, and you are in the process of helping that become something great. Well, that's what I want to talk about today. My niche, and I think who I'm speaking to, and whether this is you today or perhaps a year from now or two years from now, I'm speaking to the, to the people in the room that understand that we have those nights where we lie awake and we can't sleep. We have that idea that is compelling us. We know it's in the future. We know we have to do it. And it's just a matter of time. And every time you get lost on that idea or something happens, somebody calls you and says, I love that, you can't sleep again. And so it's this thing that's beating on your door. You know it's coming. And then you get into that process and you realize that, you know what, I'm really good at building things. I'm really good at making an idea happen, finding a need and building a process or a business around that. But when it comes to launching it, I really get uncomfortable. That's not where I, that's not where I thrive. And I've been there. I've launched a lot of things, books. Um, a book, I guess, just before I tell you how bad that was. No, there's a lot to that, right? You can write a book, and it can be a good book, an average book, or a whole book. It doesn't really matter. It's not the book that sells itself in the same way that it's not your idea that sells itself. There's a huge process that is part of concept to company. And where I get involved is I work with those organizations that aren't clear yet, or maybe they aren't quite efficient in their ability to take that idea and take it to the customer and get the customer to take action on that idea. And so I find myself coaching a lot of startups. I find myself as a sales coach for a lot of entrepreneurs because, yeah, I get it. Sales is its own animal. It's the yin and yang of entrepreneurship. You have great ideas, and that's awesome, but you also need sales, and you, you can't sell a bad idea. So together, they marry. And so an entrepreneur that understands the process of selling is dangerous. And that is what I want to talk about because in my background, I've sold a lot of different things, um, software, um, private equity, real estate, and the process isn't that different. My first attempts at selling were really, really difficult. I went and sold door-to-door -door alarms, and I had a really hard time feeling like I was pushing customers to do things that they didn't want to do, and I didn't like that. And so I tried to find a sales process, a way of communicating that was more natural, more jujitsu, more seamless for the customer where it felt like we're having a conversation and not me manipulating and forcing something down your throat. That's the beautiful thing because when I embraced that, I became incredibly successful at selling. And then I tried different industries and I found the rules were just the same. So what I'm telling you is you don't have to be a salesman and you draw the stigmas that are coming to your mind right now. You don't have to do that to be successful as an entrepreneur. But if you can understand the frameworks that I want to walk you through, I can tell you right now that you can become incredibly successful. So I have a number of resources available. Um, the Laws of Influence. Um, who would like a copy of the book? There's the first hand. It's for you. Um, they're available. I've got a bunch with me. Um, they're $20. And you're welcome. There's also a free version online. I'm not supposed to tell you that because uh, I just undersold myself, but I don't care. So. If you want to buy a hardcover because you like the way it looks on your shelf, I'll make those available. If you want to just read the book, it's available for free on my website, and you're welcome to go and download it, and I would be happy to sign that, so if I didn't already. Um, what I'm really talking about today is a startup to sell, and this is a framework that I've been evolving over the course of the last two decades to really simplify the sales process and make it seamless for an entrepreneur to take that idea and not necessarily to sell your company, but to sell the product within your company. So here we are. The three sins of sales sins of startups. I'm trying to go for alliteration here. Um, what I want to talk about first, I don't know that this is working. Is it? It's all you? Yeah. It's, it's all you. All right. So, what's our keyword? What am I going to do? Just, just wink. Okay, okay, I'll wink. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is creating value. Now, what I want to talk about is let's look at our business. Let's think of ourselves as empathetic entrepreneurs for a minute. What does that mean? What does it mean to focus on 
the needs of the customer and not making money. Because I went into a lot of businesses, I entertained a lot of ideas on the premise that I saw other people making a lot of money and I should be able to do the same thing. I figured, hey, there's not that much to that, why can't I do that? The problem was me. The problem was when I got into that business, I didn't have staying power because I didn't, didn't have my attention. It wasn't aligning with what I love to do. Among another, uh, you know, as soon as that adversity showed up, those first few moments of difficulty, I didn't want to be in there. I wasn't passionate about what I was doing. And that was a huge missing ingredient for me. So what I found, the sales process, and what I typically do with my clients, is I back all the way up to the sales process, and I start with the fact that everything we do is a function of selling. Everything. You wake up this morning, you looked in the mirror, and you all said something to yourself. You had a conversation. What, what did you say? And then you thought about your potential for the day. You thought about, what am I going to do today? How do I look? How do I feel? And you had a conversation. That is a sale in as much as me standing up here and presenting ideas to you as a sale. Or the pizza that was purchased that you're all eating, that was obviously a sale. There's a sale everywhere we go. You walk outside and people see you, and you are absolutely selling yourself. The way you dress, the way you carry yourself, the way you look, the way you talk. This is a sale. A sale is everywhere. So when we broaden that perspective, what matters isn't the product you sell, it's not the money you collect or the commission you get, it's the exchange. It's the fact that what I offer you is creating value for you. Value is what matters. So don't start your business or don't think of your business in terms of the money you make. Think of your business in terms of the value that it's creating for your audience. I believe that a lot of entrepreneurs miss this. I believe that they get stuck in the money. They get stuck in the solution that they solve and not the value that customer is going to receive. And so influence for me is what facilitates that exchange. It's everything about us that comes out in the sales process because the sales process isn't a script. It's not an option close. It's not a set rehearsed line that I deliver every single time. It's me. It's my confidence. It's the way I carry myself. It's how much I believe in what I'm offering. That's what sells. And influence, what I've discovered, is consistent among the top performers is entrepreneurship, sales, executives, leaders. It's all the same. And so the book is about bringing that out in your unique style. Why are you an entrepreneur is more important than what do you sell, in my opinion. Why is your product important is more important than how much do you make when you sell it. There's my wink. How, how is that? I can't wink without moving this entire side of my face. So I'll, I don't know. I, no, that's, that seems. Yeah, I don't like that. OK. I thought you just say sloth. Just go like this. Oh, yeah, it's OK. Go like that. OK. So here's what matters. You can create value, and that's awesome. Nobody cares about what you offer unless it creates value for them. But here's what matters. The moment what you offer, when it, sorry, I clicked and I didn't mean to. So that's not going to work either. <laughs> the moment your value exceeds the perceived cost of the customer, that's when we have an exchange. So what you should be focusing on in your mind is, what is the messaging? What are the things that I can do with my business to help the customer feel that the value they're gaining from talking to me, from buying from me, from working with me, is greater than the cost that I have to put up? It's that simple. Focus on the value. If you want a better life, if you want a better job, if you want a more successful business, get clear on where you're valuable first and then expand that, enhance that. Don't contract and don't downsize in a down market. If you're focused on the value you create, that's all that matters. That will shift, right? And that's okay, but the value is what's going to be sustainable because business still happens in down markets. It still happens in recessions. We're always, always, always in commerce. And it's always driven by value, whether we realize it or not. So this is the model that I use to teach the sales process to real estate, software, to my kids selling lemonade. It doesn't matter. It's really based on four primary objectives. Number one is the pitch. At some point, we've got to break through the noise and get in front of our audience, right? And what matters is that our ability to break through all that and get in rapport. No sale ever happens without rapport, period. So once we're able to break through and get in rapport where you're no longer thinking about me standing up here, but you're engaged in what we're talking, you're visualizing what I'm saying, then I'm in rapport with you. And then I have an opportunity to discover what your needs are. 
And so that's what I would teach a brand new first year sales rep, selling a very complex software product. Get to know your audience, get to know your customer. What is incredibly valuable to them? And once you discover what those needs are, how do you evolve, how do you mold your product to reach them and to create that value for them? That's all that matters. That's what they care about. So how are you able to build value around the needs that you discovered? And then finally, when you get to the point that the close comes, it's natural. It happens by itself because the customer has built this need up in their mind and they've seen this value and they see that the value is becoming greater than the cost and urgency is a natural byproduct. This to me, if you ever get lost in a sales script, abandon all ships and just focus on my objective is to figure out what my customer wants. The mere act of asking them what they're looking for is going to build rapport. So focus on the customer and focus on value. Transitions are just something that we interject along the process to make it a natural conversational flow. I hate being sold. I hate the feeling of being sold. I hate being told what to do or feeling manipulated. And so let's get rid of that. And let's make everything we do, even if it's not verbal, let's make the process of embracing our product with our customer a natural, seamless flow. Case study, perfect example of this, is Blockbuster. Do you guys remember going to Blockbuster on a Friday night? And the new release came out, and you're walking down the aisle, and they're all gone with, by 8 o'clock. And so you go and you kind of cruise down the horror, not the horror, the drama, and then the comedy, and so on. You've seen all of them. And you're trying to find a movie to rent. So if we back up to 2000, Blockbuster had an opportunity to buy a company called Netflix for $50 million. And they said, you know what? I don't know. I don't think that that would, I don't think our customers would see value in sitting at their house, walking out to the mailbox, picking a movie out of their mailbox and going in and watching it. And then they can keep it as long as they want for no cost, and then they'll just go put it back in the mailbox in a prepaid envelope. Probably not. No, I can't see that being a fit. And there's no way that our customers would want to just sit on their couch and stream a movie. Not a fit. Not in our wheelhouse. Definitely not what our customers are looking for. So they passed. Well, 2008, they filed bankruptcy. And uh, let's see, today, roughly $50 billion valuation for Netflix. So a minor miss, right? <laughs> but it comes down to this concept of getting in touch with the needs of your customer. I love disruptive technology. I love the discussion of disruptors, like Kodak, for example. Do you know that Kodak invented the digital camera? That very device that's up there that's recording right now was invented by Kodak, and that's definitely not a Kodak. And that's not the only thing they invented. There's a really interesting article about a number of things that they invented. And about a week before that they were shut down, before they filed, one of the executives said, I honestly think film is still coming back. Now, it may come back on an artistic level, but yeah, kind of miss that. But they have an ability to create a lot of value, but their miss in the way that they deliver that value to their audience is flawed. So what I want to talk about is automation. This is the second sin. Once you understand the fact that it's not about your product, it's about your customer, the second one is, how do we improve and make that process efficient? Efficiency is the name of the game. And we have so many wonderful tools at our disposal to create that efficiency. I love this quote from uh, E-Myth Revisited. The entrepreneurial model has less to do with what is done in a business and more to do with how it's done. The commodity isn't what's important, the way it's delivered is. This is a, an outline that I typically work with a customer. And what I'm going to share with you, primarily when I visit with a client, the challenge is the process. The challenge is that old school model is you take a sales rep and he goes from trade show to customer close. And that's a long process, especially today. In a consultative sales process, that can take a while. What we've discovered, and Inside Sales did a really interesting study on this, that 7% growth in sales was a result of differentiating the roles, having handoffs along the way. So here's the question for you. You've got an all-star closer in your organization. Do you want him making 200 calls a day to find potential customers? Do you know how many organizations are currently doing that? Do you know how many organizations are saying, well, he's really good, so I want him talking to my customers? 
But think of him. Think of the gear shift that has to take place every time he says, oh, I got one. Now I've got to shift into closer mode and walk this guy through a demonstration, and then I've got to go and close him, and then I've got to kind of manage him through the, enable, the implementation process. That's the way it used to be. And what we're discovering is this new buzzword is business development, and it's where everything is shifting. And what it means is that we break the process down. We let marketing be amazing at marketing. We let them go to the trade shows and generate leads. Then we let them dominate at that ability. And the moment they go, or we generate cold call leads or whatever it is, and then we hand them off to people that understand how to warm up those leads, to get on the phone, to vet those customers and get them excited about the product, to open the door for that value creation. Once they get them there, once they're able to build that value, then they hand it off to the closer, the expert, the account executive, who's able to walk them through the demonstration and get them so amped at the end of it that they're going to say, I need this product. And then they can hand it off to somebody that can walk them through the process, make sure that they stay, make sure that they fall in love with the product and implement it properly. That is a consultative sales process. That is what we talk about. And part of the organization is building it to sell it. Build your business to sell. So what that means is you want to map your business, your concept, from the perspective of a customer. So what does that look like? What is the sales process for me and how do I map that? And then how do I overlay tools like Salesforce, like Pardot, like Domo to start tracking information and pulling out the data that I need? Because a good process leads to good intel, good information. And that allows you to make good decisions. You need to know for this lead type, if I went to a trade show, I'm going to convert that many of those leads into a demonstration, and that many of those leads are going to become customers. And I need to know that number to the tenth decimal point as it differs from going to uh, organic online traffic or a, a webinar or everything else you do. You need to know that business, and it starts with a beautiful framework. So the next thing that we do once we have that framework is we've got to take that messaging. And these are six, seven questions that I like to really go through an exercise with my customers. And I'll say, number one, what are your customers' pain points? And let's articulate these on a level that is built for a six-year-old, maybe a sixth grader. Let's simplify. You guys are so smart that sometimes the customers don't resonate. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever felt like they're just not getting it? There's just something missing in the connection. Well, that's where I come in because I've been an entrepreneur, I've been in sales, and I'm not technically proficient. I mean, I can work my way around a computer and most things, but I can bridge that gap and walk you through and say, this is the message that I see that resonates with your audience. How do we communicate that? So let's go through, what are the pain points? Um, what are the things, what are the value points that your company offers? What makes you amazing? And then what are the questions that you can ask to get your customer to share that with you? Obviously, it's rapport-based, but just saying, you know, what do you need or what are your struggles or what are you looking for may not get there. But what are the things that you can ask them that are going to get them to share with you what those pain points are? Who are your customers? What does your customer look like? Where do they live? Where do you go? What trade shows should you be going to? See, when you map all this out, you start to build a message. And then the last one is a mantra. And my favorite example of this is uh, Printer Logic. It's a company I've been uh, working with for the last 16 months. They have a million dollar mantra. Is everyone familiar with Printer Logic here? Who's not heard of Printer Logic before? Okay. So, quickly, um, what they do is they eliminate print servers. So, in large organizations where a lot of people are printing to a lot of different printers, that's a nightmare to manage. And so, what Printer Logic does is it automates that process, it simplifies it, it eliminates those print servers so that people can print to direct printers and the IT managers, their lives are simplified because they don't have to script and manage all of the nightmares. So, that said, when you walk to a trade show where printer IT professionals live, they walk up and they see this booth and it says, eliminate print servers. And it blows their mind. And the next thing that comes out of their mouth is, how do you do that? That's a buying question. Because what's the natural response? Well, that's a great question. How many printers do you have? OK, and then how many uh, servers are you guys working with? How many employees do you have? Perfect. Well, what we do is we eliminate those print servers. We also have floor plan maps so end users can easily install their own printers. I'm in a sales pitch already, and it was all based on a really good message that somebody saw from a mile away, walked over and said, bull crap. There's no way you can do that. Tell me how. That happens. We even had someone recently say, I am not willing to do a demo because that is too good to be true. 
and I don't want to get invested and find out that you guys are somehow manipulating me a year from now. That's when you've got good messaging. And so you get on the phone, you say, hey, we're the guys that met you at that trade show. We're the guys that eliminate print servers. Does that ring a bell? Think of the power of that. It reminds them who you are. It tells them exactly what you do. And it communicates your business in such a powerful message that it initiates a buying discussion. That's the goal. And what you need to do is you need to get into a brainstorming session and dig into that messaging. Um, one of the clients that I worked with recently was Madra. And I love just the quote at the bottom. Within, we took 100 emails, we went through that same framework, and we built out an automated email campaign based on the messaging that we created on a whiteboard at Dixie State University. The next week, they sent 100 emails, and they had four demonstrations scheduled. I love that example because their product is really technical. They help um, simplify the learning platforms in like chemistry, general chemistry, all the students that are required to take the course that really struggle to make it through. They have a really interesting software tool that allows the student to figure out where they're deficient in the learning and better prepare for the exams and tests. Very, very complex, very detailed, but it's all the messaging. And then it's the automation. It's the process of getting in front of your customers in ways and where they hang out and where they live. That's what matters. That's the second most important one. So, um, so performance is the last one. And so there's no numbers on this except the years, and this is from Printer Logic. And I want to just show you a few things that are interesting about this because performance is everything, right? I mean, you can have a great message, but you want to see stuff that happens. So what matters here is this goes from 2014 till today. Everything in gray, right when it turns orange, that top line, that's when I got involved with Printer Logic. And they had a great message. They already had that, that mantra. What we needed was efficiency. What we needed was an opportunity to scale a brilliant product. And so I got involved at that point. And some of the things that are really interesting about that, if we were to basically, what that bottom line just shows the growth from year over year. Now you can see in there that there's trends that are consistent from year to year. And things like trade show seasons are big for us. And, but what's interesting about this is this is, an, this is evidence of becoming incredibly efficient. And as you can see, these bottom lines, those are the revenue trajectories. And you can see things that we start to adjust as we get year over year, you may not see in terms of account development creation. That top line is new customers that are coming into the business that are getting sent through the sales cycle. That's not closings. The bottom line is revenue. So what's happening is we're becoming more efficient. We're getting better, not necessarily generating more deals, but we're getting better deals, more revenue generating deals. We're targeting, we're getting specific. And one of the big things about that is taking a really good sales rep, the guy I told you about the closer, and now I'm gonna have him focus specifically on a segment of the business. And let him go get so laser focused that he's in his wheelhouse. Everybody he talks to, he closes. Closing ratios go through the roof because we're getting good, we're getting dialed in, we're getting specific. That's where growth happens. That's where we build a business that starts to hit radar screens of big private equity funds and acquisition opportunities. This is the stuff that matters. They want to see consistent, scalable growth. And where this starts is with the employees. You know, a lot of companies, they talk about their culture. They talk about the, the vibe, what it's like to work at my, our company. We have a great culture, right? Well, that culture starts with your people. And I've, em, I've employed a lot of different people in a lot of different industries, and motivation is one of the most difficult challenges. For startups, attracting good talent is difficult. They don't want to take a risk. I've got a great cushy job. I've got my own office, my own corner office. I don't want to take a risk and gamble on you, but I need you to invent, help me build this out. So there's the paradox. What I've discovered is going in there and building out the system and demonstrating the case study of what it should look like is the key. And then you can attract the talent because they can see the model. They can see the system. But what I believe is that everybody you hire is motivated by something different. Company incentives that we used to try and do it from a company-wide standpoint, they were polarizing. But when I got specific with an individual and I said, what motivates you? I could really create sustainable performance. And it follows Maslow's hierarchy of needs very well. Low end, you know, our basic survival needs, those translate to maybe money or just, I need a job. But that's not a sustainable motivator. So as we talk about performance, we've got to figure out what motivates our employees. And I'll tell you what it is. It's a vision. See, everybody has a goal, right? Your employees, you've hired them. Do you know what their long-term plan is? Do you know where they're going in five years? And do you know why this job 
today is helping them get there. See, I sit down with every one of my employees and I basically prep them to quit. And I say, where are you going? And how can I help you get there? And to some that might seem ludicrous to say, well, why are you showing them the door? Or why are you, you're gonna have to go hire a new person. And I'm okay with that. Because what I've discovered is if I can get you dialed in, motivated, and aligned with what matters most to you, and help you see how this job is positioning you or helping you get there, I'm gonna get so much more performance out of you than I could ever get. If I had you for two years, I'll take six months and put you on a rocket ship trajectory because that six months is gonna be awesome. That six months is gonna create a culture that we build talent and we move people into exciting positions. And I'll do that all day long because that's where we get performance. And that's where things really start to get exciting. So what does, your, what does your employee want? What's important for him? And how are we constantly evolving to get the most out of them? Selling is hard. Entrepreneurship is hard. This is where the two yin and yang come together in one. And we say, it's a difficult road. How many have had a failed business attempt before? Raise your hand. Okay, I'll raise two. Okay, so we've, we've been there, or maybe we're not quite comfortable yet or ready to launch our idea, our concept. And it's maybe out of fear, right? So this is my uh, Cha Sasun. I cannot wait to meet this lady and I will make that happen in my life. It is on my short bucket list. So she was 60 years old and she decided that she wanted to get her driver's license. She lived in South Korea. So she goes and she takes her test and she fails. So she takes the test again and she fails. Again, fails five times, 10 times, and she can't pass the test. So she pays her fees and she takes the test over and over and over again, 50 times, 75 times, 100, 200, 300, 400, 5, 6, 700, 800, 900, and 49 times, this lady took a driving test at the age of 60. The passing score was 60%. And she finally passed. And then she failed the driving portion another five times. But she got that. The car manufacturer, Kia, was so enamored by her story that they gave her that Kia Soul, featured in a commercial. And as far as I'm concerned, I want absolutely nothing to do with that lady on any road, anywhere. <laughs> Can you believe that? Think about how bad you want something. Think about how hard you've pushed in your business, in your role, how valuable you are. See, it's all about persistence. It's all about perspective. And it's being so dialed into the things that we love the most, what we're passionate about, and why I'm standing here. This is why I was built. This is what I was built to do is to help people. And I am living that. And when I get in touch with that, great things happen. What is that for you? And how hard are you willing to push to make that a reality? And I want to leave you guys with my favorite quote. <clears throat> John F. Kennedy said, the, the problems of the world cannot possibly be solved by skeptics or cynics whose horizons are limited by obvious realities. We need men and women who can dream of things that never were and ask why not. So dream big. Think about your purpose. Think about your business. Think about the value. And don't stop. Go for it. And uh, reach out if I can help. Thank you very much. <laughs>